Fine, that's the second riddle. Third riddle, much shorter than the other two. Darwin's delay. Why did Darwin, you can turn that off because that's it for slides. Why did Darwin, having developed the principle of natural selection in 1838 and being fully aware of what he had and how important it was and being young and ambitious and wanting credit for it, why does he delay until 1859 before publishing? And it's pretty clear it wasn't out of diffidence. I mean, he knew he had it, he was pretty sure he was right. He left his wife strict instructions that should he die before writing The Origin of Species, that alone among his unpublished works, she should publish the preliminary sketches of 1842 and 1844, in which he had developed the theory of natural selection. He wanted it out. So why did he delay? Uh, no, I think one has to say, and I'm not saying anything at all original here, anyone would say, this Darwin was obviously afraid. It must have been fear that was motivating him not to publish. And therefore, one must ask, fear of what? Now, the obvious answer would be, but it's wrong, fear of exposing his belief in evolution, which is supposed to have been the great heresy of 19th century science. If you know anything about the history of evolution, you immediately realize that cannot be true. I used to say in lectures like this that evolution was the most common heresy in the 19th century. That's not right. It wasn't even a heresy. The most you can say is that evolution was the most common unorthodoxy of early 19th century science. You didn't get in trouble by confessing a belief in evolutionary change. I suspect somewhere close to a majority of uh, the great biologists of Europe accepted some form of evolutionary argument. If you go to France in the first decade of the 19th century, of the three great zoologists there, Geoffroy, Lamarck, and Cuvier, it's only Cuvier who's anti-evolution, Geoffroy and Lamarck are both evolutionists. Richard Owen was an evolutionist in his own way. One of Darwin's teachers, Grant at Edinburgh, was a, an evolutionist. No, one did not get in trouble for exposing a belief in evolution particularly a nice, friendly, positively spun belief that evolution means predictably progressive change up the ladder of progress to human beings. In some spiritual sense, moreover, as many 19th century evolutionary theories had it, so it cannot have been fear of evolution. He was afraid, in short, in a way this sums up what I've been saying, of the radical philosophical implications of the principle of natural selection, of his own take on evolution, of his own theory about how evolution occurred, not of evolution itself. Now when Darwin wrote about this to himself privately in his notebooks, what he said is very interesting. And I think it captures the main point. What he said is that he was afraid to expose his belief in materialism. And by that I don't mean the usual vernacular sense today of love of BMWs or Armani suits or anything like that. I mean the philosophical position that contrary to the deep tradition of dualism in which you have material stuff or matter and mental stuff or spirit constituting the universe, dualism, in which the spirit stuff being of God at least initially is the higher of the two forms, Instead, materialism claims that there is only matter and that all those things we consider spirit and imbue with divine this or that are really just manifestations of properties of matter arranged in complex ways. And what we call the mind is a product of the material substrate of the neurology of the brain. Now that's a radical notion in 19th century terms for which one could get in considerable trouble. And I'd just like to read you a couple of Darwin's own statements about it. Here's a, a marvelous one where he, in a sense, uh, is expressing his intellectual joy at his apostasy. He says, love of the deity and effective organization. In other words, is it really true that our love of God is just the result of the way the, the uh, neural substrate of the brain is organized? Oh, you materialist. He's talking to himself. Why is thought being a secretion of brain more wonderful than gravity as a property of matter? It is only our arrogance and our admiration of ourselves. That's a brilliant statement. And here's another one where he's very explicit, tells himself, don't admit your materialism. He says, to avoid stating how far I believe in materialism, say only that emotions, instincts, degrees of talent, which are hereditary, are so because brain of child resembles parent stock. In other words, don't just say that, 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 that Children are often like parents because it's a principle of inheritance. Don't say it's because it's a material substrate that we're inheriting. Just leave it alone. No, that really does run contrary to the greatest Western philosophical tradition of dualism, the separate realm of spirit with spirit higher than mind. And so in short, if you want to summarize the three, it's the naturalism and the purposelessness 
of the Adam Smith analogy for the first riddle. It's the non-progressionism of the second riddle. It's the materialism and the other forms of philosophical radicalism of the third riddle. And it's interesting because if you look at what's common to non-Darwinian evolutionary theories through most of time since 1859, it's their unwillingness to accept these philosophically radical postulates which deprive the universe of intrinsic, friendly, furry meaning in human terms. There's most other theories, theories like neo-Lamarckism, which state that organisms respond creatively to felt needs and can convey their own desires into changing form. Or the theory of orthogenesis, which says that there's inherent progressive predictive tendencies in evolution. Or the theory of vitalism, which says that life has that special something distinct from non-life which drives it forward. I mean, all of these, in a sense, have in common their desire to, uh, to escape from Darwin's implications. But I would like to, to end this, and I have a few minutes of tape I want to play as an actual end. One of the more amusing misuses of nature that pervades the history of Western thought on this subject is our endless attempt to find moral meaning in nature, to find the exemplification of principles of right conduct and living, and it just doesn't work. I mean, nature is neither kind nor cruel, it simply is as we find it, and it's full of phenomena that are repulsive to us or joyful to us, and it must be so because there are no inherent moral messages. My favorite example is the story of the so-called ichneumonid wasps. This is, in fact, a large group of wasps who paralyze prey, usually caterpillars, and lay their eggs directly in the body of the caterpillars, who are still alive, though paralyzed, the young are born, then eat up the caterpillar from inside, but very carefully, making sure that they save the heart and nervous system for last, because they don't want to kill the caterpillar, lest it rot and destroy their source of food. Now, there's one of the most horrible events with respect to our moral hopes, but nature doesn't care. It's merely an adaptation that's good for wasps that caterpillars haven't been able to overcome. And yet, if you look at the history of comment upon this, throughout the 19th century, various rectors and interpreters of nature for our benefit tried to find moral wisdom. They argued, for example, that we had here an excellent case of mother love. Look at the wasp caring for its progeny. Or the argument might have been that we have to get rid of caterpillars anyway because they're such a scourge on human crops and it doesn't matter what mechanism nature uses. Or people looked at the uh, care and husbandry of the little larvae as they kept the heart and nervous system for last is a good example of the use of resources in intelligent ways and saw that as a proper model for human agriculture and exploitation. But it just doesn't make any sense. The point is there are no moral messages in nature. Darwin understood that perfectly well and in fact used the ichneumonid wasp as a primary example of why you couldn't find them. And that's appropriate. I don't think science contains the answer to moral questions. Moral questions have to do with the way in which we ought to live our lives. Science can only tell us about the way in which the world is constructed. Now, some people think that's depressing and therefore think that Darwinism is a terrible system that we have to expunge from our schools and erase from our thoughts. But to me, it's exhilarating and challenging. I don't want to passively read the answer to great moral dilemmas in nature. I want that to be an active challenge to the humanistic side of our minds. Moral answers are something we have to construct from the depths of our own lives. We don't read them passively in nature. They're not there. I'll just read you one poem. This is Thomas Hardy, one of his many anti-Darwin poems, if you This is Nature's Questioning, where the objects of nature are despairing at Darwin's new world. Hardy says, when I look forth at dawning, pool, field, flock, and lonely tree, all seem to gaze at me like chastened children, sitting silent in a school, and on them stirs in lippings mere, as if one's clear in call, but now scarce breathed at all. We wonder, ever wonder, why we find us here. <laughs>